Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Creepy Airbnb Stories. If you've never used Airbnb before, it's a website and app that allows you to find unique accommodations all over the world, from private rooms to entire homes. People who have extra space, like a spare bedroom or vacation home, can list their property on Airbnb and rent it out to travelers. Airbnb collects personal information from its users as part of the booking process. This includes information such as your name, email address, phone number, payment information, and other details that are necessary to complete a booking. Airbnb takes the privacy and security of its users' information seriously and does have measures in place to protect it. That being said, it's important to always be aware of the information you're sharing online and to take steps to protect your privacy. I mean, have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed on one of those public listing sites? Data brokers are making a fortune, upwards of $200 billion per year, selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. That's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but they make it super hard to do. Let Aura handle it for you. You can try Aura free for two weeks using my link, aura.com slash interscare. Aura also does so much more to protect you and your family from online threats that you can't see. Things such as financial fraud protection, identity theft protection, VPN and online privacy, password management, antivirus protection, family identity protection, and parental controls. It's really easy to set up, so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. As a parent myself, I do everything I can to keep my kids safe online, but I can't see everything 24-7, especially when my teenagers are playing video games in their room. But Aura really helps me keep up to date with their online habits. With Aura, I can block risky websites, monitor screen time, and even turn off the internet to their devices once it's time for bed. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online, so you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off of your private information, or you can go to https colon slash slash aura dot com slash interscare to start your two week free trial. Also linked in the description down below and in the pinned comment. But for now, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I'm keeping some of these details vague because I seriously don't want the host to find out that I published this story. I don't think they would approve. I hope that's all right and I'll still try to make it as comprehensive as possible. I spent a year studying in Mexico recently and as you do on exchange, I tried to travel as much as I could. Between the semesters, there's a big break and me and my buddy that I spent the most time with during the exchange decided we'd go on a longer backpacking trip through Mexico together. We had a rough plan on where to go and what we wanted to see, but we hadn't even booked our flight back yet, nor were we sure from where we would take it from. We wanted to keep it flexible. We had an amazing time, and a few days before our trip ended, we finally described we would take our flight from a city that was close and really cheap flights, but the city itself didn't really have anything to offer. Then, on Airbnb, we found a room very close to the airport, in a house with a pool, and we thought we'd just treat ourselves to a relaxed pool day at the end of the trip. It turned out that the hosts were a family, the husband was Mexican, and the wife was from Europe and could even speak our native language. So we arranged that we would take a bus to the airport, and that they would pick us up from there. When we finally arrived at the city, it was already dark, and the bus driver refused to take us to the airport, 
since it was not directly on his route, so he just dropped us off on the highway. That was already a pretty crappy situation to begin with, standing with our backpacks at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in a not-so-safe city in Mexico. But I called the hosts and sent them our GPS location and they say no problem, they'll come and get us. So the husband came to pick us up and it was a very uncomfortable situation getting into a car with a stranger in the night in the middle of nowhere. It also didn't help that the guy looked like Danny Trejo without a mustache. And as I tried to make small talk with him, he only gave monosyllabic answers or straight out ignored me. Well, he's just not a big talker, I thought, and I hoped that we would arrive soon. Looking back, I can see a million red flags. But for some reason, at that time, we just didn't see them. Either we were too tired or, to be honest, we didn't really have any other choice than going along anyway. But yes, we arrive, and that should have immediately set alarms off. We were in the middle of effing nowhere. There were fields with sheep and goats around, and all of the sudden, a gravel road branches off from the paved road, and along that gravel road, there are about six huge mansions, all with two-meter walls around them, topped with NATO fence huge gates, and at least two gigantic guard dogs per house. When we entered the house, we were greeted by the wife, a bubbly middle-aged woman that was very talkative but pleasant. She had actually cooked dinner for us, and we ate while exchanging small talk. The husband just sat at the table not saying a single word. After dinner, we more or less went directly to bed because it had gotten late, and we were tired from a long day. The next morning, we saw that the weather was not that good, so we decided to go into the town and just see the few touristy things it had to offer instead of spending it at the pool. When we came back, it was already dark, but we decided to just jump into the pool anyways to cool off because it was very hot and humid. The wife joined us, and at some point, my friend made the mistake of asking how they were able to afford such a house. It didn't really match the price range of the jobs they were telling us that they were doing. And she just deflected a bit and added that her husband was very handy because he had grown up in the streets and basically he built the house himself. We realized that it maybe was not the best topic and just broke the conversation off. That was the last day of our trip and we had our flight back home early the next morning. We still had some weed left that we had bought on the trip and we thought it would be nice to smoke one out since it was our last night. But as this was a family home and they had kids around, we thought it would be better to speak to our hosts and ask if they would mind. So later in the evening, we asked the wife if it would be okay if we smoked on the terrace, which for some reason she found quite amusing and started laughing. She shouted to her husband who was lying on the couch watching TV. My love, the boys ask if it would be okay if they smoke some weed. What do you think? And he just laughed but didn't give an answer. We looked at her with a dumbfounded expression and she told us, sure, just go ahead. So we went to the terrace and started smoking our joint. Later they joined us and we just had a chat. And this is where things start to really get messed up. For some reason, they start asking all sorts of questions about the weed, where we got it, how much it was, who we got it from, and how much we would have to pay for that back in Europe. They just seemed way too interested in the weed And at one point, the wife just nonchalantly revealed to us, yes, we thought about doing that as a source of income, selling weed, but too many people die doing that because the cartels don't like it. Actually, my husband used to kill people for doing that. I immediately felt sober. Did she just say, and as if he read my mind, her husband added, yes, when I was about 16, I killed a lot of people for the cartel for money. And he just said it in a tone as if, He just said that he used to mow lawns when he was a teenager. I still thought that I must have misunderstood, so I texted my friend who was sitting across the table from me, trying to not make eye contact, because I knew that we would freak each other out. He confirmed that I had indeed understood right. We discussed what we should do, and agree that there's no immediate threat and that we should just stay. We don't have anywhere else to go anyways, and it's already late. But things got even crazier. We tried to keep our composure and not completely freak out while still making conversation with our hosts. A few minutes later, though, the husband got up and went inside to get something, and he came back with a literal kilo of weed, pressed into a brick. He proceeded to break bits off the brick and roll them into a joint. That would probably have knocked out Snoop Dogg. 
It was about the size of my thumb, and I guess it had about two grams of weed in there. Of course, he offered the joint to us, but we politely declined, saying that we were already pretty stoned. He seemed a little offended, but fortunately he bought our excuse. But it got even worse. A few minutes later, we hear a couple of loud bangs. The wife became a bit uneasy and asked, What was that? To which he answered calmly, Nine millimeters. To confirm my suspicion that that had indeed been shots. I would say it was around seven or something shots, fired pretty quickly after each other. The wife got nervous and asked if we should maybe go inside. And what do you think they are shooting at in the air? At cows? At people? but he just shrugged it off and we stayed outside. Again, a few minutes later, there were more shots, this time even closer. The wife got even more upset and asked again, should we maybe go inside? What do you think they're shooting at? Should we go inside? And I think I will never forget when he answered in the calmest way imaginable. No, everything's okay. I didn't hear any screams yet. I don't know why, but the way he just calmly said that freaked me the F out and is still making my heart beat whenever I think about it. After that, we quickly excused ourselves and went to our room. When we finally could talk, we basically both lost it and panicked. What were we supposed to do? We were locked in a house with a contract killer in the middle of absolutely effing nowhere, and people are shooting outside. We decided it was probably our best bet to stay, because we thought, well, we're his guests. He's not going to harm us. Hopefully. And it's better to have walls and dogs, and a serial killer, in between us and people shooting around. So we barricaded ourselves in the room, and didn't sleep a second until the morning, when we noped the F out of there and went to the airport. I was never so happy to be patted down at security in my whole life. This is my first post ever, so sorry if it's worded weird or the formatting is off. So me and my boyfriend, his best friend, and his girlfriend drove up to the Big Bear 626. Then a day later, another friend of ours drove up 627, and he was supposed to sleep downstairs and couples sleep upstairs, since there's only two bedrooms. The first night we stayed there it was kind of creepy, because the cabin was pretty remote and of course there's absolutely no lights outside. It is the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless completely normal activity. On the 27th, around 12 a.m., my boyfriend and I are in bed, when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods, and that the motion light came on and there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed to check the entire cabin, and even goes outside. Nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with sliding glass door that looks out to the woods. It's important to note that I'm a naturally very anxious and scared person, while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical, while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin, so he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my God. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180 pounds, and he's a CrossFit coach. And to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and backed away slowly. He quietly says, There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods looking at us. At this point, I'm thinking he's messing with me. He looks at me and says, Go lock the door. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it, as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. About 30 minutes go by, and nothing happens. I get annoyed with the heat, and the fact that there's five people in a tiny room, and three of them are men. So my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked, so my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30 a.m., I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine, and he understands, so we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I set up and look at my boyfriend. He looks back at me. 
then the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling and I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up and we grab our phone and run to the other room where everyone else is staying. I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are alone out there. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. I realize now it's a bit of an overreaction, but at the time we thought we were going to die. He's on the phone with the sheriff and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we were too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more, and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and a power outage. They send the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m., and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep, and the next day we talk to some of the locals of the area. We told them our power went out, and they said that was strange, because that shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm. He said he couldn't explain it. I wanted to share this story to warn people, but it's not necessarily a creepy encounter. Just sort of a story that is weird and freaked me out. Please delete if it's irrelevant, but I do not know where else to post to warn people. I'm traveling around the country in my car. I've been driving for over a week from the city I lived in and have so far slept in my car to save money. It wasn't until I got to a big enough city that I decided to treat myself to an actual bed that would be comfortable. I opted to choose Airbnb because it's cheaper than hotels. I booked this Airbnb the day before I arrived to the city, so there weren't many options left. I had found this apartment on Airbnb that looked very new and modern, and it was in a great location. The price was decent for its location, and it almost seemed too good to be true. The only downfall was that it was listed as a new listing and had zero reviews. I figured that the price was low because it was a new listing, and I decided to give it a shot. Must be legit because it's Airbnb, right? When I got to the apartment building, it was older looking than I had expected. I later found out slash realized that my Airbnb was most likely the only renovated apartment in the building, and the building seemed to be in poor condition. It looked more like a dorm hall rather than an apartment building. Anyway, I let it all slide because I wasn't paying too much, so what could I expect? The apartment itself looked like the pics, so that was good enough. Everything went well for the first two days. As a female traveling alone, I always make sure to be safe. I don't go out when it's dark, and I always lock the door. Every single lock, including the chain thing. Anyways, on the third day I was out all morning, and came back to the apartment to change to head to the beach. I had again locked the door, including the chain. I was in front of the door watching TV while changing, when the door suddenly unlocks and someone opens the door. I am beyond lucky that I had put the chain lock on the door, or else it would have opened all the way. I was naked and no one else was supposed to have the keys. My first reaction was, excuse me? And I closed the door right away, locking it again. I came from the back of the door and did not look slash see who was opening it. I sat in front of the door, scared and shocked, realizing that this person could technically still get in here since they obviously have the keys to the apartment. At first, I thought maybe it was the owner coming back after I checked out, but I was not supposed to check out until the following day so that wasn't possible. After crying for a few more minutes, I recuperated myself and called the owner and told her what had happened. She told me that no one else should have a set of keys other than her and I, and that she's at work and it was not her. I was scared to stay in the apartment because someone could come in. I didn't want to leave because I had all of my valuables there. It was a lose-lose situation. I then called my dad, who told me that it was not okay that someone has the keys and that she needs to take care of this as soon as possible. So he talked to her, and she told me that she will be there shortly with a locksmith to change it and give me a new pair of keys. She then proceeded to tell me that she had only had this apartment for six months, and that before I stayed there, there was only one other Airbnb booking. 
She also mentioned that it had been sitting empty other than those two bookings because she had been renovating the apartment, which now makes sense why the building looks like absolute crap and doesn't match the apartment. She told me that the only possibility for who that was could be the previous owners or someone related to them. Isn't that illegal? That possibility slash theory really messed with me. How was it possible that I was gone all day every day and the 10 minutes that I was home during the daytime, someone tries to come in? Did they know that I was there? What were they coming in for? If this apartment has been sitting empty for half a year, maybe they did this frequently. Or maybe they saw me come in and tried to do something to me. These questions are constantly on my mind. I just know that I am so lucky that I put the keychain on the door, or else. I don't even want to know what else could have happened. Needless to say, I won't be leaving a good review, and I won't be staying in an Airbnb that has no reviews or seems too good to be true. Edit. To people thinking that it's the contractors, apartment building workers, etc., the owner said that no one else has the set of keys except for her and I at the time. So the only option was the previous owners, someone close to them, or the other person who had previously stayed at the Airbnb and made a copy. Either way, that experience was messed up. So I'm currently staying at an Airbnb with some family before I go back to my normal boring life, and I've been noticing some things that just don't feel right to me. 1. There are no normal doors in the house, only barn doors with their bottom stopper removed, which make it incredibly easy to simply push them off the hinges. 2. There are peak holes in different areas of the house, that makes it easy to see into other rooms without someone seeing you. But what has been the final straw for me? is that last night I swear I started hearing movement in the attic of the house, but have no way to check because I don't have a stepladder that can reach the entrance. Update as I'm writing this. I've just heard tapping on my ceiling. I'll update this in the morning if I have not been murdered by a serial killer. Wish me luck. Before bed update, because I realized I forgot to mention why I'm not as paranoid or worried as someone who is alone might be. I have a 180 pound dog that would rip anyone to shreds if they tried to hurt me or my family. And yes, she is awesome. Update. Seems we have a pretty good end to this little creepy encounter. I messaged the owner and he drove over to the Airbnb to look at the stuff. Explained that one of the previous renters was a bit insane in the membrane and drilled holes in the walls and how he hasn't had the chance to fix them yet. As for the noises in the attic, the owner grabbed the ladder to let me look around and I found a big fat raccoon up there. My name's Natalia, but people call me Tally, and I'm a 21 year old language student from Leicester currently doing a year abroad in Bordeaux in the south of France. I haven't made too many friends here. I'm not too much of a party girl like my big sister, but the friends I have, I hold dear to me. I won't bore you too much with the details of my life here, but so far after the first few months, nothing too eventful has happened besides a couple of run-ins with some local troublemakers. But other than that, I've had a really nice time. The food here is lovely. The city is beautiful, and the weather is a lot nicer than back home. British people making jokes about the weather back home again, ha ha. A couple of weeks ago, we took a trip around the south, to my friend Clement's hometown, June. There are lots of beautiful little villages scattered around this part of the countryside, which are very peaceful, calm, and the people are pleasant. This is not an area that tourists typically visit. You find that the locals are often bemused to find a foreign person in this little part of the country. Not too far from Gun, there is a slightly larger village called Eugenie Le Bans. I may sound like a broken record here, but this is another very stunning part of the country that probably not many people know about, besides the locals. In the town, there is a Michelin star restaurant, 
and we decided to pay a visit here for my boyfriend Brad's birthday, his 23rd to be exact. And as it was now two years since we had met, it was nearly our second anniversary too. He had taken time off of work to come to France to visit me, and we were glad to be spending some time together again finally. We booked a table for four in the restaurant. Me, Brad, Clement, and his girlfriend, Jeanette. Initially, we had wanted to book into the restaurant's hotel as well. However, it was too dear for students like us. We booked into an Airbnb instead on the outskirts of town. We enjoyed a lovely meal and then sat outside drinking wine and smoking cigarettes in true French fashion. We then went for a late night stroll through the town, enjoying the quaint little frog statues situated within the town. After we got too tired, we decided to head back to our Airbnb and rest for the night before we would just head off to our next destination. Clement's girlfriend, Jeanette, was Catholic and always wanted to visit Lourdes every year as part of her faith. We eventually made it back to the room and had another glass of wine and a couple more cigarettes before we headed off to bed around 1 a.m. I woke up at around 3 a.m. to the sound of something scratching by the door or window. I couldn't tell as I had never been there. I wondered if it could have been a dog or perhaps another small animal like a cat maybe. However, the sounds faded away almost as quickly as they appeared and I quickly drifted back off to sleep. Not long after, however, I was awoken again, not because of any sound from outside this time, but because Brad had gotten up for the bathroom. I lay back down on the pillow and closed my eyes, but then a sudden sense of dread filled me. I don't know how, but I had a gut feeling that somebody was watching me. I looked around the room, with only the moonlight bringing in just enough light to see. I looked over to the window, which should have been closed via the shutter, but again, with Brad not being used to the life around here, he had forgotten to lock it. I could see it slowly being pulled open by a hand outside, its silhouette lit by the moonlight, attempting to open the window while holding something that I couldn't quite make out. I then heard what sounded like an old-fashioned camera shutter closing repeatedly. I hadn't heard one of these in many years, not since my grandfather would take family photos of us. But as I've heard this so many times before, it was unmistakable to me what the sound was. What felt like an eternity passed by before I could bring myself to open my mouth to yell out to Brad. The person at the window quickly began to climb down, and whilst briefly in the moonlight, I caught a clear glimpse of a very distinctive ring on the left hand. I didn't get a long look at it, but it did appear to be wooden, with a distinct marking on one side. Seconds later, the assailant was gone. Brad rushed outside to try and see who it was, but all he saw was an empty street and could hear the sound of footsteps becoming more and more distant. We didn't sleep a wink the rest of the night. Neither of us dared to. We checked out of the room as early as we could once there was sunlight. Clement and Jeanette went to get the car while me and Brad returned the keys to the lockbox. I messaged the host about what happened, and while he did seem sympathetic, he said he wouldn't be taking any action against what happened. A few days have passed, and we still have no idea who tried to break in. Brad thinks it was the host as they weren't too apologetic. However, Clement says it's because they're rich snobs and don't care about foreigners so we'll likely never figure out who it was. The creepiest thing for me is that some perv has a photo of me lying nude in bed, and I have absolutely no idea who it was, and whether or not it might end up online somewhere. This past weekend, I was at a bachelorette party in Scottsdale, Arizona. We rented an Airbnb that is managed through a property management company located in a cul-de-sac that had one other rental. The other houses were residential. The front door had a key code that they changed for every new guest check-in. On the last night, we stayed up until about midnight before all going to our separate bedrooms. Two girls locked up. Front door. Back door made sure the garage door was closed and that the garage entry door was locked as well. We were all into true crime, so definitely overly aware. 
if that's even possible, of our safety slash surroundings at all times. Fast forward to 3.30 or 4 a.m. ish, and one of my friends wakes up because she heard a door slam closed, and someone say, hello? She's freaking out and can hear this person walking towards the room that she's staying in with two of our other friends. The intruder opened up the door, and my friend shouted, who are you? And the intruder, who looked like a girl our age, said sorry, and ran out of our house through the garage door. She and the two girls in her room got up and closed the door and checked everything else, and it was all still locked. On the other side of the house, one of my friends had woken up later in the night because she had a super unsettling feeling that someone was watching her while she slept. Her room had floor-to-ceiling windows with sliding doors going out to the pool. She had no idea that any of this other stuff happened until the next morning. It was really scary the next morning because everyone else had slept through all of this happening. If the intruder had bad intentions and my friend hadn't heard her enter, a very different and scary scenario could have taken place. We concluded that the property management group was not changing the entry door keypad codes or using the same exact code for both rental houses on the cul-de-sac and the girl was drunk and got the houses mixed up. Either way, very creepy night. My husband and I got married during level three lockdown in New Zealand. We wanted to do something special the night of our wedding, so we got an Airbnb in a harbor near where we live. The place was the back house of someone else's house and kind of in slash near a forest. It was also pretty small, one room and a bathroom. We had just gotten married, so we were acting very in love that night for lack of any better word. We also had the windows open because we believed that where we were was very remote. When we decided to go to sleep, my husband decided that since we were in New Zealand, there was no need to lock the door. And like an idiot, I went along with this. We go to sleep and a few hours later, at about 3 a.m., there is a distinct loud knocking on the wall that our heads are laying against. There were about seven knocks spaced out evenly to be exact. It was that kind of sound that to me was deliberately trying to wake us up i shrieked and then my husband looked out the windows for movement there wasn't any movement or sound after just extremely still what's also weird is the airbnb had motion sensing lights on the opposite side of where the knocking came from it was almost like whoever it was knew not to set off the lights also because i think people will ask i know in my gut that this came from a person and not an animal or wind, etc. After a few hours of being terrified, we didn't hear anything else for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked the Airbnb host about it, and they said they didn't know anything and were genuinely sorry. They even let us stick around past checkout to enjoy the view a little longer. To be honest, I genuinely don't think it was them. I know this isn't as creepy as some of the other stories on this subreddit, but I still wanted to share because I don't understand why. Why would someone want to just wake us up, especially if the door was unlocked? A part of me wants to think that it was someone homeless looking for a place to sleep, but then why would they try and wake us up? Why not peek in a window that we stupidly left open? Another theory is they were doing something perverted and watching us earlier in the night. Again though, why would they want to wake us up four hours later? I appreciate any and all speculations, because frankly, these questions keep me up at night. There was a time I almost stayed in a murder house Airbnb for my bachelorette party. I was one month out from marrying my best friend and the time for my bachelorette party had come. I had spent so much time talking about this saying, if we don't almost die, did we even do it right? I definitely didn't mean it in the way it almost happened. My ladies and one wonderful gay gentleman were leaving our area on Friday after work to head to San Diego. I have horrible anxiety and had a stressful day at work, so my friends attempted to get the party started by pre-gaming before the drive. Designated drivers excluded, of course. I accidentally got a little too turned, 
and my anxiety was flaring up again, so I decided to try to sleep until we got there. My group consisted of my mom, mother-in-law, all the girls in the wedding, and my one guy friend. Most of us are all college-age girls. We get to the house, and I'm still under the influence and very out of it. When we got there, I really needed to use the bathroom. My mother-in-law approached my friend that was driving us and frantically started whispering about something. I thought I caught the phrase, someone's in the house. That caught my attention, so I asked my mother-in-law if I had heard her correctly. Was there someone in the house? And she replied calmly, no honey, everything is fine. I was the kind of intoxicated where everything is blurry, and to see something your eyes really have to zoom in or you can't make it out. I kind of felt like Baymax in Big Hero 6, when he runs out of battery if that makes any sense. So I make my way up the stairs to this beautiful house. I walk in the doorway to say hi to my sister-in-law who is setting some things up. I stop when I see men's slides by the door. I carry on assuming that they're my brother-in-laws. When I remember that he's not here, and the only other man on our trip doesn't wear slides like that. Huh. I shrug it off. I quickly say hi to my sister-in-law and make my way to the bathroom. I slump over while I pee and my head is spinning. I look up and notice a couple of weird things. It's only me and my sister-in-law in the house so far. Everyone else is making their way up with their bags and suitcases. So why is there already shampoo and body wash in the shower? Why is there a men's button-up shirt hanging in front of me? Then I notice something super creepy. There is a second door in the bathroom. The top and bottom half are separate, so they can open independently. The halves are only velcroed together, but the door is locked from the other side. Now I'm confused, but I'm also very drunk, so I plop my confused butt on the couch and try to sober up a bit while we all get settled in. Then my mom and mother-in-law look a little concerned. We rented the whole house to ourselves. The host knew it was for a bachelorette party. Now we notice the cameras inside the living room. We weren't told about these. It's around this time that my mom notices that each bedroom has its own lock code to get in. But there's one bedroom that she doesn't have the code for. Not to mention that the doors automatically lock. We notice this when the front door shut behind us and locked automatically. My mom uses the code she does have and starts inspecting the rooms. Each room has a different theme and one of the rooms is decorated with a gun on the wall. At this point, my mom is unhappy with how weird this is turning out to be and contacts the host to complain about the cameras and how we weren't aware that there would be any. He assured us that he doesn't watch them. They're only there for safety purposes in case any of the tenants wreck the house. My two mamas both start to settle down and set up for the party. That's when my mom gets a call from the host yelling at her asking why there are so many cars in the driveway. How would he know that unless he was watching the cameras? At some point, he's screaming at my mom over the phone so loud that she has to pull the phone away from her ear. Put a pin in this. On the phone, the host and my mom are going back and forth about issues within the house, like why it seems like there is so much stuff here if we have the house to ourselves. And that's when the host lets something slip that makes both of my moms believe that he's in the house with us, which would account for the room we can't access and the weird door that's locked from the other side of the bathroom. But even worse... Remember how he was screaming at my mom earlier? If he's in the house, why can't we hear him? It's because the locked room we can't get in might be soundproofed. That was enough, and my two mamas jumped into mama bear mode and yelled at us to grab every bag we could and run to the car and pack up and go as fast as possible. It didn't help that half of us were intoxicated trying to carry stuff down the stairs. Thankfully, I was mostly oblivious to the situation at the time, and only noticed a mild sense of panic in the group. We all rushed to another hotel, while all of the husbands, boyfriends, and my fiancé were calling us frantically to see if we were okay. We settled in and had a great night after that. The next morning, I woke up with very little understanding of what had happened. I woke up in a beautiful hotel with the sun shining and happy, while the other members of the group woke up with leftover terror and panic from the night before. While it was definitely a scary experience... It gave us one hell of a story to tell when we got back.
This happened in earlier 2017. I was a 23-year-old girl and had just finished college. The field I studied was not huge in my area, so I decided to leave. I moved to the biggest city in my country to make a post-graduation course and look for a job. As I was still unemployed, I decided I would wait to make a long-term rental contract, worrying about a bad commute to work. In the first couple of months, I was switching from Airbnbs and hostels all the time. I was already tired of this. I decided that this would be my last move and then, with or without a job, I would settle. I was already running out of money and decided to stay in a dorm in a hostel next to where I was taking classes. Sharing a bedroom is not a problem to me during a trip, but when you're living somewhere, trying to create a routine and have some privacy, sharing a bedroom with a complete stranger just sucks. I would share the dorm with three guys, but my bad encounter was not with any of them. They were nice, apart from one of them snoring really bad at night. No biggie. In another dorm, though, was the creepiest person I have ever met. He was in his mid-30s and was not traveling. He was a native from the city that we were in and was using the hostel as a new house since his parents kicked him out of theirs. He introduced himself and tried to be nice and flirty to me. I was polite initially, but declined his interest. He wouldn't stop. He started following me all day long inside the hostel. Anywhere I went, he would show up in less than five minutes. On my second day there, I left the hospital to a job interview, and by the time I arrived, late in the night, he was seated alone in the front stairs waiting for me. He told me this like it was the most natural thing on earth. He would buy me snacks, ask me out, try to get information about my personal life. All of this while I had already made clear my lack of interest in this friendship. All of this happened in three days. I was already exhausted of his presence, but what I didn't know is that it could have went way worse. As soon as one of the guys that were sharing the dorm with me left, he asked the hostel staff to switch dorms and stay in the same as me. Obviously, he didn't tell me this, so imagine how surprised and disgusted I was when I saw him coming up to the dorm with all of his belongings. I was so scared of his presence around that I slept wearing jeans to avoid any sort of advantages that he could take from me while sleeping. The very next morning, I decided to leave. The situation had exponentially went worse, and I couldn't handle it anymore. While I was packing, this guy showed up, noticed what I was doing, and started to cry, asking me not to leave him. Then, to make things more creepy and disgusting, he told me he would miss seeing my face while I was sleeping, and thank God he had taken photos. I was trying my best to keep calm about his behavior, but I just lost it when he told me he had taken pictures of me while I was sleeping. I took his phone from his hand, asked to see his pictures, and deleted all of them. There were a bunch of photos of me sleeping the night before. I left the hostel, and I really regret not reporting him to the staff. So I'm closing in on two years since I moved into my current roommate's place, which got me thinking about an incident from two years back. To set the scene, I'd moved a long ways from home back then, out of state into a whole other region of the United States. I had moved because of a better job market, well, at least for someone like me who never did bother with college, because of a better social climate, to put a little distance between me and my parents since they do drive me a little too crazy for me to be that close to them, and because I hated the weather where I used to live. I was 30, for the curious. Striking out on my own for the first time. It was risky. I didn't exactly have much in the way of money, but it was something I needed to do. I had nowhere concrete to stay yet. I knew a few people in the area, but none I could stay with long term. Just some friends who let me room with them for a few weeks in their tiny apartment while I got things in motion. And I'm not complaining about it being tiny, because I was grateful to be allowed to stay a bit. Just the tininess factored into why staying longer wasn't going to be a thing. We all agreed it was just too cramped with four people sharing space. So I decided to start Airbnb hopping instead. Eventually, Airbnb got too expensive for the long term while I was trying to save up money. I wasn't saving up anything. Between what I was making at my new job and the cost of decent lodging, 
plus, you know, having to eat. So I decided to rough it in my car for a little while, figuring I could save up faster by cutting lodging costs completely. I just joined Planet Fitness to shower and shave there, slept in a car, center with a grocery store, laundry mat, and storage center, and went to a nearby library for internet. I was planning to start looking for a place to live a short ways in. In the meantime, I kept working and saving up a good deal faster, figuring I'd at least wait until I had three or four pay stubs to provide proof of income, as seems to be the norm for people seeking roommates. So the time came where I decided to post an ad on Craigslist for a room share wanted. Craigslist had worked out okay for me in the past with making car sales, and while I'd try responding to posted roommate wanted ads, they fell through. Just never worked out. So I have my ad up, explaining my situation, minus the living in the car part because I didn't want anyone knowing that I was homeless. I was new in town. I worked this sort of schedule. This is what I'm like. 30-year-old male. Didn't matter if I lived with men or women. Wanted something LGBT-friendly because I'm gay, etc. Included a recent and unique picture of myself for authenticity. I get a few responses. Nothing. Nothing. Mm. And then Daryl shows up. Daryl is allegedly a school teacher. He's in his 50s. I only saved one of his emails, the most important one. So some of the details are a bit fuzzy. He seems normal enough pleasant enough that I'm just a little wary already but we exchanged some short emails introducing ourselves explaining what we're looking for he asks if I have a car I tell him I do I just ask him for a few more details and who boy if it's all right I'd like to just go ahead and post the full text of his last email minus a few town names that might narrow it down because a summary really just didn't do it justice I have a house in this town, which is near this town's border. The reason why I asked about a car is because I live out in the woods and you'd need one to get around. I don't text. I'm a very private person. I'm very sick and I've been through a lot of tragedy since 2008. Many of my family members have passed away from cancer. I basically live alone in my dream home that is cluttered with tons of stuff as I had to clean out all my dead relatives' houses. At one time, I was basically a millionaire as I owned several rental properties. I lost it all trying to save my family. But that's a long, depressing story that I don't want to bore you with right now. Every once in a while, I look through Craigslist housing wanted ads to see who's out there looking for a place to live. I've tried to have two people before come to live with me, and it really didn't work out. The first one was a woman who was desperate because she was living out of her car, and I read her ad and felt sorry for her. When she came to live with me, she snuck a boyfriend into my house during the day. I found out about it when the police called me in work, because they were called to my house when he beat the crap out of her, over her stealing his drugs. The next person to come and live with me was a young African-American man, 20 years old. He was the son of my neighbor across the street. I knew him since he was a baby. I'm deadly allergic to cigarette smoke and I never saw him smoking. I thought he was a good kid. I started coming home and thought I smelled something burning all the time. It was the middle of winter, and when I questioned what the smell was, he'd say, Oh, I had a fireplace going today. I hope you don't mind. Then I started getting really sick and developed a lung infection, as I have lupus and have had a heart attack. My doctors keep telling me that my lupus condition was deteriorating, as they couldn't find another cause. Then, one day, I came home and found a cigarette butt in my kitchen sink. I went up to his room and went inside and found cigarette butts all over with burn marks in my carpeting and on my grandmother's antique bedroom set. When he got home, I freaked out and told him he had to leave. I've just had these bad experiences. My house is in disarray and I really could use someone to help me straighten things out. I have a guy that comes over every Saturday to do the yard work, but I need help with things on the inside. I'm in my 50s. I'm not gay, but that's another thing I'd have to discuss. I don't know what LGBT friendly means to you, but that makes me wonder for a minute. I just thought that your ad sounded like you were a good, honest kid, and maybe we could help each other out. I know your workplace is a distance from the town that I live in, but it's not too far to commute. I just thought it might be interesting. I would really prefer to talk by phone. I won't be available tomorrow, but if you're off on this day that day or whenever maybe you can give me a call then i usually go to bed around nine or ten just let me know and take care daryl 
So yeah, I get this guy's horribly unlucky life story in which everyone he ever knew and loved died. He's had a string of horrid experiences with people. He didn't know I was gay after I mentioned it in my ad. At this point, I have to wonder what his body count is. I'm not interested in finding out firsthand. I kindly turn him down, by which I mean I responded with, Daryl, where do you come up with this stuff? And asked him if anyone's ever actually bought it. I tell him I'm insulted that he'd think I'm so dumb and I'd fall for that, and that's that. Afterwards, I never get a response from him via email, but I do get a few calls to my phone from unknown numbers, all leaving voicemails where a very staticky voice shouted my name a few times in a really aggressive manner, like, OP, OP, pick up your effing phone, I know it's on you, stuff like that. None of the numbers worked when I tried them back. It weirded me out. So I said something to the security people who worked in the shopping center where I slept. They said they'd keep an eye out for anything strange. Tapered off after about a week with no further incident. Either way, a week or so later, I got contacted by the person who would become my current roommate. And things are going much more smoothly. As for Daryl, the supposed school teacher with the worst luck, I hope that I don't ever have to meet him. About a year ago, I spent a decent amount of time working in a different city than I live in. One day was particularly cold, and the Airbnb I had booked was pretty far away. I didn't have a car and had failed to pack a warm coat. I ducked into the K-Bart nearby to buy something I could wear on my walk, with the intention of returning it the following morning. My best option was this enormous, extra, extra large fuzzy bathrobe. My walk home led me through this beautiful botanic garden along a waterway. It was nearing midnight and I was halfway through my journey. I'm usually quite aware when I'm out, particularly at night, but I had let my guard down a bit, due in part to the enormous bathrobe I had wrapped around me. It was like wearing a fuzzy suit of armor. Suddenly, I felt intensely uncomfortable. I couldn't quite put my finger on what I'd heard, but my immediate thought was a couple of males holding a whispered conversation. I rounded a corner and ducked into some trees sucking my breath in and straining to understand what I was hearing. Light footsteps. Voices. Two men neared my hiding spot on the path, and I internally berated myself for not being more careful. Nobody was out, so screaming would do nothing. I'm a very small female, so the situation was one of my worst nightmares. As they passed, I heard, she's around here somewhere. I felt physically sick, until one of the guys let out a low whistle and I heard the jingle of a collar, a dog scurrying past my spot, and a good girl, followed by smoochy noises. An intense sense of relief followed. They were talking about their beloved dog, not hunting me. They seemed harmless, endearing even. I readjusted my bathrobe to cover my head. It was so cold, and popped out from the trees. I didn't realize until I later looked at myself in a mirror that the bathrobe arms were now on top of my head, sticking out like some grotesque, bulbous monster appendages. I also didn't realize that the men had stopped, or were walking very slowly, only a few meters ahead on the path. One of the men screamed in terror when they saw the emergence from the trees. The other swore loudly, and they both took off running across the bridge over the waterway, followed closely by their dog who was now barking frantically. I still have the picture I took of myself in the mirror after the incident, and I get the giggles every time I see it. I must admit, it was a rush to finally be on the other end of a let's not meet. Reading some of the stories on here reminded me of something that happened during my holiday this past Christmas. I went on a family holiday with my dad, mom, and brother to Tasmania, which is kind of like a big island to the south of Australia. I wasn't terribly interested in the trip, just wanted to spend time with my family, so I left all the bookings to my dad, which I'll never do again. He has his own Airbnb that he manages, so I thought that he would be able to find decent places on his own. 
when we rocked up to the Airbnb, my dad booked, the first thought I had was, if I wanted to sell drugs, I would do it here. My mom wasn't impressed at all and was already telling my dad off for booking it. I didn't say anything. Maybe the inside is nicer. It was a dingy little house. The paint was peeling, the roof was rusty, and there were plants overgrown to the side of the building. Imagine it's grown into the actual foundation and wooden planks. There were three entrances. The first one I worked out was the entrance for the host. It looked okay, not as bad as our entrance. A little tidier. I went downstairs, so we figured out after a while the host most likely lived below us. The second looked like it was the main entrance to the house, but it was sealed shut. The door looked like it would break down if anyone was even to push on it slightly, and was obviously unused. The third was ours. Aside from the overgrown plants, it was fairly normal. From the looks of it, we figured out later that it looks like the host had divided the house up somehow. She lives below, we live upstairs. But there was one half of the house upstairs that wasn't accounted for. Hard to explain, but the space we occupied only accounted for half of the house, and it only went up to the main entrance I spoke of, which is in the middle of the house. We checked in, just grabbed the keys, the host has never contacted us at this point. All was well on the inside. It looked a little old, but wasn't creepy from the get-go. I did notice some odd things. I only mentioned this to my dad. There were a bunch of antique instruments displayed at the entrance and right on top of one of the pianos were three things that looked like urns. Now to explain, I am of Chinese descent. These urns freaked the F out of me, guys. Some people think they're for displaying, but we use it to store dead people's ashes. So I really, really didn't like them being there. I told my dad and he didn't like it either, but he went and tapped the urn to see if there was something in it. He couldn't tell though, but he mentioned that The one he tapped was definitely ones we use for ashes. It had scripts on it for like safe passage to the heavens from what I could make out. After I stopped freaking out, I went and picked first dibs on the biggest room as per my usual, but then noticed that there were heaps of mirrors around the room. Again, another thing, not sure if it's a Chinese thing, but we don't like sleeping with mirrors facing us when we are in bed if we can help it. So I went to move one of them, which was smack dab in front of the big bed. It was leaning against a door, and when I turned the mirror away, the door actually opened ajar a little. That freaked me out. I got my dad and we decided it's better that I slept with my mom in another room, and he would take this room with my brother. There was another room, but it's getting along, so I'll explain in the comments if anyone is interested. Again, my dad being dad, he opened the door a little and shouted, hello, before I told him to shut up. I had a peek inside but couldn't make out much, only that it was dusty and seemed to be part of the other half of the house. My dad soon after put a chair in his suitcase on top of it, in front of the door to keep it shut. Fast forward to that night. Everyone was sleepy and went ahead to bed. I stayed up a little because I had some emails from work to catch up on, and went to work in the living room area. At one point in the night, around 11.30pm, I remember there were a few thumps on the roof, Sounded like someone's footsteps. Then followed by the loudest and most horrendous noise. It sounded like a train was on top of me. It was screeching like steel on steel, and it lasted maybe for 30 seconds. I literally froze at that point. I didn't know what to do. Thought my dad would come check on me, but no one ever did. I didn't say anything the next morning, because I thought that I may have imagined it out of tiredness. The following night, same thing again. Except I was in bed this time. Just got into it, so not asleep yet. It was around the same time that the exact same noise started up again. My mom woke up, but was frozen like me. Dad came to check on us, and we were all just frozen there listening to this noise, wondering what the hell it was. After it stopped, we were freaked out, but managed to shrug it off and went to sleep. Before I fell asleep, I remember hearing some faint thumps that stopped shortly after it started. The next morning, we kind of had a meeting of some sorts to discuss this. This is when I told them about the night before. We were extremely unsettled at this point, and luckily it was checkout day. We just got the hell out of there, and we never found out what it was. The creepiest thing was, after we packed up and was well away from the place, Dad was driving, but he still looked really disturbed, so I asked him if he was okay. He said, 
I am now, but I did not have a good sleep last night. I pressed on and asked him, was it the noise? He said no. That didn't bother him much compared to another thing that he experienced. What bothered him most was when we left for our tour on the second day, he still had his suitcase on top of the chair blocking the door in his room. He just showered, so he also left the towel on the chair to hang. He said when he came back, he noticed the door was slightly ajar. The chair had moved slightly, and the towel was on the floor, as if someone tried to push it from the other side, but unsuccessfully after they noticed there was a lot of stuff on the other end. I forced him to ask the host about the noise in the door. She replied that the door was the door to her art room, and the noise was just a possum on the roof. I do not believe her. The noise was not something an animal, or even a human, can make. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you get an excellent night's sleep. Again, please make sure to check out Aura for all of your internet safety needs, linked in the description down below. Thank you again to Aura for sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching. Have an excellent night, everybody. Good night, and I'll see you in the next video.